Yes, this will be very... How many hungover people in the audience, at least mildly? And you want me to talk in a very soothing voice, maybe low volume and something nice, partying like tone? No! I will absolutely not let... I will not let you off easy. Um, we will talk about data quality tonight, or today. And it's not something to be silenced about. It's a very important thing, and I will show you why. Uh, how many people from Norway in the audience? Okay, this will be a free like travel advertisement for you guys because we did this road trip in Norway in the northern coastline last year. And I don't have any cool stock photos about data. Turns out there isn't any. So I just have fam like vacation shots here too. Do you know where this one is from? Yeah, yeah so this one is like um, Sommaro near Tromso in the Norwegian Sea. So I will, it's going to be a vacation stuff as well. So. Very briefly about myself, um, I work at a Finnish company called Reactor. I'm the senior data advocate, so something to do with old people data, I think. Um, I also work as a Google developer expert for Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager. It's a, it's a position that Google uses me for slave labor and doesn't really give anything back, which is fine. Uh, I have my blog at simohava.com and then I'm very active in social media. So I have. Um, kind of a two-part presentation here. The first one will be a bit ranty, like, like talking about data quality in general. And after that, we get to the meat of the thing where I'll just show you some of my kind of favorite ways to use the platforms to your advantage, to Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics. Um, I don't have any kind of technical step-by-step -step stuff here because I've written about most of them, so I just have links to my blog. <laughs> get some acquisition traffic right there. So. Plug and play analytics, like this is the big problem these days. It's, it's um, like I was at this Google Analytics Summit just in San Francisco this week, and um, they had a tagline for the summit. It was simple yet powerful. That's, that's like the weirdest tagline. I don't think you can do those two at the same time. You either go the simple way and you lose some power along the way, or you go to the heavy power user stuff and you miss on user intuition and, and UX at the same time. So there's a weird trend with analytics tools where they try to make everything really easy. They say data is easy to come by, just plug it in and you'll have your reports coming in. I don't think data works that way. I don't think data should be made easy. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this kind of multi-million, billion dollar business around data, right? If, if it were easy. Like, what are we talking about here? Data is easy. We're just showing our, how to build our, you know, our businesses and stuff like that. So I have a really big problem with plug and play analytics. And I try to fight against it every single time I get to a conference or whatever, and in my blogs as well. Mm. This is the heart and soul. So we use tools that are used by millions of businesses, right? So Google Analytics has, I don't know how big its user base is. I know it's millions of websites. Um, same thing goes for Adobe, IBM, WebTrack, whatever. They're all designed according to certain common lowest denominators. They all have to be good enough for all these businesses. This leads to the fact that Google or these tools don't necessarily know what your KPIs are. Like when you install Google Analytics, it doesn't tell you this is how your business is optimized. This is your business goal. This is your thank you page. You actually have to build those into the tool, either by setting up events or setting up goals or setting up e-commerce tracking or doing something completely wild. And so few companies actually do this, do this with a passion. They're more satisfied with the fact that you just plug it in and you get the page views in and then you can celebrate. There's a very, very big problem with this. Um, so this is a very, you know, okay, I'm stereotyping a lot here, but I've seen these reports, so I just have to put it up here. This is a report a CMO might get, you know. Dear boss, last month the number of sessions to our site was blah, 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 which is an uplift. They had an uplift there, so that's a cool word. We hear it in CR all the time. Must be very, very interesting. And then there's a big party going on. Yeah, so this is not a Norwegian, this is not a vacation shot. It might be, but it's a, it's a great stock photo. I love stock photos. We should use them more just to go against, the, go against the grain. The problem with that report, you can replace sessions with conversion rate or bounce rate or whatever kind of weird, meaningless KPI I want to use. Who can actually say what a session in GA is? Like right now off the top of your head. Can you can just tell me all that? Mm. Let's, let's see, let's, let's walk through this. So a session is a group of interactions that takes place on a website, simple as that. You open the browser, you go on a website, you close the browser, that's a session, right? No, it gets a bit hairy. Um, there's a timeout window, so there's a 30 minute timeout window. After the last interaction, you have 30 minutes time to return to the website and the session will continue. So you have, it expires in 30 minutes. You can change that number, by the way, in Universal Analytics. Or 
hits midnight, so if the session starts at 2359, and then it comes midnight, the session is cut off and a new one starts. And this is according to the time zone of your view, not of the engine that calculates the stuff. It's your profile time zone. So you'll see different session is say, sessionization things depending on your profile time zone. What's up with that? Does that mean that if, it, if sessions reflect your business, should you kick everybody out of your website at midnight just to be aligned with the sessionization? I don't know, maybe. Okay, well that's easy. We can still live with this. Oh unless the acquisition campaign changes. So if you came in through Google Organic, you leave the site and you come in through an AdWords ad, even before the 30 minute window expires, and you session again, right? Of course it is, That's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, unless the referral is in the referral exclusion list, that you've said that this isn't actually a referral, so then it will drop the referral, it make direct traffic, and because of Google's infinite wisdom with their last non-direct click attribution, your session will be plugged into the session that was the last non-direct acquisition. That, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's how our businesses work. That's what we think about when we report on conversion rate, right? Oh, there's one more thing. Cross-domain cross tracking, right? So I have multiple root domains. They all have their own cookies because that's how browser security works. Unless you have cross-domain tracking involved, then the cookies are sustained and you can persist your session across unless you implement it incorrectly, which is pretty easy because it's so bloody hard to do. It's so difficult to do cross-domain tracking. I mean, I could make a living just fixing cross-domain tracking problems. Unless you use Google Tag Manager, right? It's the, the bright shining light of everything we do in implementation. But that's a bit difficult as well. So when you report on session-based conversion rate, when you talk about bounce rate, when you talk about sessions, do you actually consider all this stuff? Do you actually think your business considers all this stuff? When you use anything that's sessionized, anything session-based, you're subscribing to a schema of a platform. And this was just Google Analytics' way of determining a session. Pivot has its own. IBM has its own. Snooby has its own. Snowplow has its own. Your BI cube has its own. So when you compare, it's like comparing apples and oranges. It just doesn't make sense. And yet our whole industry is based around a sessionization, which is completely arbitrary. So tweak the list that I showed tweak any one of those, just even the slightest bit, change the session timeout from 30 to 29, add a new referral to the exclusion list, remove a cross-domain traffic from a domain, all seven of these metrics will change in your reports. That's how powerful sessionization is. You tweak them even the slightest bit. If you have enough data, you'll see a major difference in what you're doing. There are some things that won't change, like revenue and transactions, they're like absolute numbers. They don't have to do, they're not sessionized. But conversion rate, again, session-based conversion rate, which we use in everything we do. Um, in my view, this has two major implications. I'm not saying to kill it off. There's a very good foundation for sessionization, and we use it in attribution model. We use it in touch point analysis. I would love to, love to see a day when we have a, like an equal distribution between user-based conversions as well, because that's what we're also, because sessions don't really convert, right? Users do, so people convert over multiple sessions, for example. But there hasn't been a really good innovation in that field for some time. But the two implications, the first one is to stay away from aggregate metrics. So staying away from buckets, total visits, total bounce rate, total whatever. Even segmenting on just a superficial level of acquisition channel has a big difference. So like the enlightened way to do analytics is, is to look beyond the plug and play stuff. Combine the data with your backend, a, a CRM, Google Analytics integration should be like the foundation of every single business. Combining the web user to somebody who's in your customer database and pulling that data out and doing stuff with it. Segmenting stuff, we should all be doing that all the time. Visualization and then the kind of holy grail of prediction where the tool might actually, or the visualization or the charts might actually tell us what, where to put our money in next month. That's the kind of stuff we want to be doing to fight this sessionization problem. Stop looking at aggregate stuff. And the second one is just that the metrics just suck. I mean, the, the kind of plug and play stuff that they give us, like, like, you know, we can have a long, very boring discussion about bounce rate all night. It's, it's gonna be horrible for everyone, but we can still have it, and it's necessary to have with your colleague or someone, because it's such a complicated metric. And we still see it being used as a KPI, alone, a standalone KPI. So, the way I see it is that we have tools like Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager. We take those tools, we bend them to our will, we turn them into machines that work for us instead of us playing into the hands of these schema overlords who tell us that this is how you should do your business. So we take the tool and we twist them around. 
And in this toolkit, I have um, 10 kind of tricks or, or my favorite hacks, just, just to make a very clickbaity title, um, for, uh, for using GGM. Some of them might not be relevant to you, but um, what I want as a takeaway is to be inspired by, it doesn't really take even that much effort, just some JavaScript savvy, and we can actually be turning these platforms to our advantage. The first, oh, okay, so this is actually my summer house because it's such a nice place. I just wanted to make you all very jealous about it. It's a beautiful Finnish lake with a pier, and there's a, there's a smoke sauna right here, so you can just go straight out and swim. It's amazing. Feel free to come over anytime you're in Finland. Open invitation. Not really. So the first trick is to add true hit timestamps. So this is for the kind of BI nerds out there. The one thing that's missing, one of the many things that's missing from the Google Analytics API is when you pull a hit out, you ask for give me all the page views and blah, blah, blah. They don't have a timestamp. And, and that's, that's a terrible, terrible thing. You want to know when a hit happened and it's every single time. So they don't have a timestamp. You get this. I mean, if you guys have $150,000 every year to dish out for Google Analytics Premium, you actually get this because it's part of the BigQuery reports. But the GA API doesn't have this. So what we'll do is we'll create a custom dimension in GA. Um, so I'm not going to be telling what this stuff is. So if you don't know, there's going to be links to the articles later on with the terminology. So we create a custom dimension, which is hit scope. So every single hit gets this custom dimension. In GTM, we have this, this is a very simple function. What it does is it creates a timestamp of that moment. It creates an ISO standardized timestamp, which is accurate up to milliseconds. And it adds the time offset. So the big revolution here, revelation here is, when you look at um, GT, uh, Google Analytics time of day reports, you know, let's show you when, when the hit happened. First of all, they're hour based. And second of all, they're configured to the profile time zone. So if someone from US came to my site, I would see their, them as mor morning at 4 a.m., morning 3 a.m. So imagine me trying to fix my AdWords bidding on the basis of my local time. That's not how it works. I have to target it to US and use their time zone. So that's why I fixed it in that it shows the local time so that I'll know the actual time where the user is in so that I can see that the US guy actually came in at 12 noon, which makes a lot more sense. But it also gives me the offset. So it gives me the offset compared to universal uh, UTC. So I'll be able to see like which time zone they were in. And then we add the dimension to the Google Tag Manager tag. So every single tag gets this dimension. And then we'll end up with a report that gives me the time. So now you can see there's the offset in the end. The first hit came at um, minus 7 compared to UTC, and the second minus 530. And then it has the time. That's, that's like ISO time. And there's the link to the article. And you'll get these slides, so no need to you know, copy paste it. So this way, we can actually start aligning hits with their timestamps. OK, this is Kilpisjärvi in northern Finland, like at the very north of the, of the made, Finnish maiden head. Um, it's looking at Sweden, because Sweden has all the cool mountains. Our highest mountain is like you know, a kilometer high. It's not actually even a mountain. It's a fell. And half of it is in Norway, so it sucks. But it's a very beautiful mountain. It's Baras. It's a very good hiking trail, actually, as well. So I recommend you take a look at it. So now we're adding client ID. So client ID is what GA assigns to every single browser instance. It's what makes you a returning user. So if you go with your browser to a website, then you leave, and you come back with the same browser, GA uses the client ID to identify that, hey, you're a returning user. You're the same guy who was here yesterday, or the girl. We'll start by creating a custom dimension in GA. Now it's user scoped. User scope means that all my sessions after this dimension has been applied will be automatically added to this client ID, which makes sense because then I only have to send it once. This is a bit more complicated because GTM doesn't support what I'm doing right here, right now, probably because they don't want me to add the client ID. It's secret information that GA uses in the servers. Well, screw them, you know, let's do it anyway. It requires a bit of custom HTML tagging. It's, it's all gonna be in the guide. And then there's a data layer push where I, where I tell GTM, okay, we've got the tracker done, we've got the client ID. Then all we have to do is, is add it to the tag as a custom dimension. That's the link to the guide again, and then we'll see, we'll see every single session aligned with a client ID. Now we can pull that data out again and see every single session by a specific browser, for example. We can see all the hits with their timestamps all aligned with the browser or the client ID of the visitor. And we can start chopping away at Google's way of looking at things. We can start building our own customer journeys, not the aggregated stuff, the behavioral flow report in GA, you know, the one with the weird 
red dropouts and the flowing things going from box. That's a horrible report. It's completely failed. It's the, one of the most difficult reports to understand. So now we can build our own aggregate customer journey reports because we know which hits belong to which user and when they happen according to the time zone. But there's one thing missing from this puzzle. And that's session ID. Okay, now we're in, now we're in Lofoten, the beautiful uh, peninsula on, on the north. It's like the most beautiful place in the world. Fjords and shit, right? Amazing stuff. Fisher, little fisher villages. It's so beautiful. So for session ID, we create a session scope custom dimension. And session ID means, this is again in BigQuery, but not in the free GA. When you pull two hits from the GA API, there's no way of knowing if they belong in the same session. That kind of an identifier is missing from the API. So now we want to recreate it. It's a very simple uh, JavaScript variable which just returns a random string. But because it's a session scoped custom dimension, this random string is attached to every single hit in the session. So we end up with every hit in the same session will have the same random string. So, and then we add it to, we add it to um, the page, page view tag for it. You only have to send it once per session because it's session scoped. And then we end up with a report. Now we have four discrete, discrete event actions. Some of them were happened multiple times. And you can see that these four belonged in the same session. You can, so now we have hit timestamp, session ID, and client ID. We can build our own sessionization scheme. We can, we can unravel what Google is trying to force feed us, and we can start rebuilding it with these building blocks in our own data, database or API. We can compare timestamp transactions to our backend used to be so incredibly difficult, but now that they're timestamped, we can compare it, that yes, this is the exact same transaction, or this transaction is missing. It should have happened then, but it didn't. I'm not talking about user ID here, by the way, because that's kind of a default thing by now. There's a lot of good guides about it, but that would be the fourth piece of the puzzle. So seeing logged in users, seeing all the client IDs the user, this user has, seeing all the sessions these client IDs have, and then seeing all the hit timestamps. So the, this lets you build your own kind of BI database out of GA data. How cool is that? You can combine it with your CRM data and be like this data wizard for, in your company. You won't, I mean, I don't think you'll find it very useful at first, but you will grow into it. Okay. Again, a very, there's me fishing, by the way. We got a mackerel, and then a cod, which just by throwing the line in there, and they just jump at you. It's amazing. I'm not sure if you were allowed to fish there, but this would happen at 4 a.m., I think, so there were no police around. So adjusted bounce rate. Who's heard of it? Adjusted bounce rate. It's a very cool thing. Not happy with your site's bounce rate? Well, we can tweak it so it gets slower. You don't have to improve the content at all. You can just tweak the bounce rate. Do you, do you want to know how to get a really kick-ass conversion rate, by the way? Make your home page a goal. So every time somebody lands on their home page, your conversion rate just, why are you guys doing CRO? That's the way you optimize your conversion rate, right? It's so simple. So now I'll show you how to make your bounce rate better. So the, the adjusted bounce rate, the most boring way to do it is like after 30 seconds of the user time on the page, you just send them into GA as if that magically means that they were more engaged with your content, right? Well, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. The bare minimum requirement is that you add a scroll event. Because I open pages and tabs all the time, right? There are many that I never go back to. And even if I do go back to, I might open the tab and then click somewhere else, but the timer starts from zero. So the 30 second bounce, bounce killing thing just happens when the browser isn't even open. So adding a scroll event is at least the least bit of indication that the user is actually interacting with the page. So again, this is a custom HTML tag. Fires on DOM ready when the pages, page HTML has loaded. And it basically listens for a 30 second timeout and a scroll event, and then it sends the bounce killing, bounce killing event. It's very easy to set up. Um, and you know, you end up with these events that I call no bounce, and what it is, it, it actually kills the bounce for the page. So if you're really desperate about getting bounce rate down like artificially without actually doing anything to your content, this is the bare minimum you should like abandon that horrible time pulse. That's, that's, just, that's just bad data and bad analytics. Or you can take a step further. This was also a very beautiful, uh, this is on the way from, from Lofoten to Apisko, which is northern Sweden, also a beautiful place. Lots of great fishing rivers. Now we're tracking scroll depth. So Justin Kotroni and Nick Mihailovsky wrote this scroll depth thing for GA. They weren't the first people. There are some really good plugins out there for that. So the way the scroll depth works is that it sends an event when you first load the article, then it sends a second event when you're like 25% into the article, then another event when you're 15% into the article, another one when you're 75, then one for when you reach the end of content, 
and finally when you reach the end of the page. So you can actually start looking at these articles were read the furthest. This article was read like up to halfway. Or if you find that all your articles are only read like 25% in, you might want to start sticking your CTA to the top of the article instead because no one's reaching the bottom. Or social sharing icons, put them on the top instead. Well, you won't probably get very many social shares if you, people only read the first fourth of your article. So this is a bit more complex. It, it involves a very complicated uh, HTML, or not a very, but quite complicated JavaScript thing. A lot of tags, you have to create variables, um, stuff like this. There's a GitHub project where I took Justin's solution and turned it into GTM, so if you want to set it up in GTM, it's a bit easier now. I, I hope somebody writes a good article about it. I'm, I just don't want to do that because it's not my, not my own, own IPR. But you get a report like this. This is aggregate stuff, you'll, so you'll see that, okay, surprisingly, 25% is the most common way, way to scroll on this. It's a bit depressing that people don't actually read the whole article, but that's, that's internet, guys. That's how it works. And then you can segment page by page, see your most read articles and so on. But the really like kick-ass way to do it uh, is to take enhanced e-commerce, which is the new funnel-based e-commerce reporting in Google Analytics, and instead of using it for products, you use it for your articles. So if you have a blog on your site, if you have content you want to measure, you, start, you take the terminology of enhanced e-commerce and start using articles instead. So enhanced e-commerce, you set up basically a checkout funnel, and then it's, there's, a, there's a shopping behavior funnel, and then you can see product by product on, on the, how these products pass through the funnels. I'll show you an example soon. The first thing we have to do is figure out the terminology, because we're not using products anymore. We're using blog articles. So just a few things here. For example, product price, I use words in an article. It's a beautiful vanity metric. I can say 30 million words were read on my site last month. How cool is that to say in a pub to someone? It's very lame, actually, don't try it. But as, as kind of self-enforcement, you stand in front of the mirror every morning and say, let's hope I get five million words today or something. Um, add to cart is when you first scroll an article page, so you're kind of making, a dead, like trying to engage, maybe adding it to the cart, maybe I'll buy it. Then there's the scroll depth plugin that we just saw, but this time it's, it's the checkout funnel. So one third of the page is the first checkout steps, two thirds of the page is the second checkout step, and so on. And then the purchase is when you reach the end of content and you spent an appropriate time, of, time on the page. Like 60 seconds is my arbitrary limit. And then there's a, there's a couple of really complex custom HTML tags involved. Um, a lot of tags you have to create. This is, an easy, this is not an easy solution. Like, let's forget, GTM isn't easy, let's start with that. Forget the marketing speech, it's, it's actually pretty complex. It can be easy, but it's not. And then the awesomeness appears. So here we have a checkout funnel. I can see that there's a very linear progression from, from people who read only one third to two thirds to the whole article and how many people end up reading it with like passion, so spending some time on the site. There are many ways to do this. That's why I had the sort out your terminology first because it's really important that you negotiate the terminology based on your own like article and content stuff. And you get this report. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just go over it because it's a bit small font. So here I have my products. These are my articles, right? First of all, 37 million words last week. How cool is that? That's, that's such a vanity metric. It's so, much, so awesome. I can see that um, by average, my average article length is 1,900 words. It's, it's a bit on the shorter side because I write these small tip posts as well. My longest article, 5,000 words in this list, had a byte-to-detail ratio of 13.67. So 13.67% of people who opened the article ended up scrolling all the way down and spent time on the article long enough to purchase it. The shorter one, um, the one that's 2.6K, had a 31% byte-to-detail rate. So what is my big takeaway? People read shorter articles more. Wow, <laughs> that's what data tells us, right? Amazing insight, just with this short, small, uh, small thing at all. Amazing insight. I thought it was the other way around. I thought that people read the long stuff. I'm a bit disappointed in humanity, but I'm, I'm glad to know that the initial hypothesis is correct. This does let me optimize. It doesn't let, I don't, I'm not gonna change my article length because of this. I, I, don't want, I'm not, I don't want to be that guy who just tries to get people to read more stuff, but it might invite me to add internal links more, maybe split up my longer articles into shorter ones just to get people, because I want people to scroll down to the comments as well. That's very important for me. 
So the whole solution is in that, the, under that link. I have a link to a GitHub project which has the open source code, but it's, it's horrible, ugly code. This should be done with a developer. I just did it quickly as a prototype, but just to be inspired by it. It's a very interesting thing to try. Okay, this is the mackerel that I was talking about. Just right off the open fire, we have a mushroom sauce there, creamy stuff, you know, it's like drooling when you just look at it, it's so good. So internal traffic is something part of every GA audit. You have to get rid of it, you know. At least one profile which only has external data. Internal traffic is, is, is polluting. I had a situation where, where a customer, a global customer said that, yeah, it's weird because we have this low bounce rate and no conversions. In turn out, they had 45,000 employees and every single employee had their home page as the opening page when they start up their computers. That's 45,000 hits in the public profile of GA every single morning and God knows how many after that. And it takes the conversion rate down because these people weren't buying their own products through the public website. So internal traffic blocking, and usually you do it by IP address, but it, it can get really complex if you have salespeople on the road with a, with a dynamic IP or, or sales offices or people working remotely. So this is a simple solution. You basically go to a URL with a, an add a query parameter, and all the sessions that had this query parameter will be excluded. It's, it's a very nice workaround. It requires you to remember it, so maybe instead of having the home page as the starting page in this co company, we added the query parameter there, so now it works nicely for everyone. So we create a custom dimension, then there's a view filter in GA, where you basically say that if the internal traffic custom filter has the pattern true, then you exclude it out of this view. Then you create a macro or a variable in GTM, which basically looks for the, the word internal in the URL query parameters. Then you add this as a custom dimension. So what happens now is if I go to my site and I have internal equals true, the tag will send the value true to GA into that custom dimension we just created, at which point the view filter will grab it and exclude it from the view. It's a very simple way of adding internal traffic filtering if you can't do it with IP address. There are other ways as well, but this was the one I wanted to include. The article has a number of other ideas you can try. This is a perfect photo except for the construction machine in the back. I, I don't have the Photoshop skills to remove it, but it's a beautiful little fishing village in, in Lofoten again. This is a bit geeky, but if you know GTM, I mean, you have these auto event tracking. You can track clicks and link clicks and form submissions, history events, and JavaScript errors without having to actually add any code to the site. But we might want to track uh, form changes or blur and focus events or uh, mouse down, mouse over, hover, all these kinds of things. And at the moment, GTM doesn't let us do it, so we create a custom HTML tag. You copy paste this and you change the first variable event type, you add to there whatever event you want to be tracking. It could be mouse over, it could be mouse out, mouse down, blur focus. I'm using just change. So change happens when somebody go, enters a form field, edits the value within, and then leaves the form field. So it's a good way to fire an event when the value of the form field changes. Then there's a, there's a custom JavaScript variable which works as a generic handler. So you can create multiple different custom HTML tags for all these different events and have them all use the same JavaScript variable. Um, and then all you have to do is create a trigger which has event, dot, and then the event name. And then you'll be able to fire your tags when this event is, is, is reached. And there's the guide again. Um, it's a very cool way to kind of customize GTM to work for you. There's my wife and myself. Um, that's the Norwegian Sea. This is 4 a.m., so the midnight sun is actually a thing. I think you saw it last night as well in in, on the beach. It's a very, very beautiful place. So weather, this was a thing that I wrote two years ago or something. We can actually add weather as a dimension to our, to our GA data. Here's a little flowchart thing, because we all love them, um, on how it works. Uh, so basically, just put in a nutshell, the script first geolocates you. So it takes your IP and looks where you're from. It gets a latitude and longitude. Then it sends this latitude and longitude to a weather API, which returns what the weather is like at that latitude and longitude. And then you add that into as a custom dimension to your tags and you'll see weather for the session. You'll see if the visitor arrived when it was cloudy, if it was rainy, how warm, how cold it was. So I'll just, you know, there's a couple of custom dimensions, a very complicated HTML tag, um, blah, 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 and we end up with data like, yeah, on a, on a rainy day, e-commerce conversion was 17.72 or something. By itself, it's not that useful, but as a, as a kind of insight to what might have resulted in a lower or higher conversion rate. The other problem is that this is here and now, right? This is whether in my location at the time of visit. 
if you have a golf course, you want to see what the weather is like next weekend and at the golf course. So you can actually do automatic bid adjustment with an AdWords script. So if the weather is really horrible, you can automatically bid more on your simulator ads and get people to come in for sauna and golf simulator instead of going out on the range. And if the weather is really nice, you can pitch some, some summer discounts or something. Or for a spa, you know, if the, if the weather on a public holiday is absolutely horrible, it's a perfect time to put up your spa advertisements because people want to take it easy. Okay, and there's the, there's the article again. And number 10, this is, so this is Saanafel, one of the mo like, most iconic mountains. It's a mountain, it's basically like 100 meters high, but we call it a mountain because we don't have anything else. And a beautiful Kilpisjärvi Lake. Um, so page visibility. Now, I will go very quickly over this and just actually jump to the article. The way it works, the article is up there, is that you know page views, right? Well, of course you do. So, did you actually think that they are fired when somebody views a page? Because that's what the metric says. No, they're fired every time a page is loaded, so they're actually page loads. I had a bit of an issue with this, so I only want to fire a page view when actually somebody views the page. And the HTML5 has an API for that. It tells you, is the document hidden or visible? A document is hidden when it's in a browser tab, when it's minified, or when it's something else. So it actually has to be in the active browser viewport to be visible. So I, I wrote this script which basically defers the page view until the page is actually visible. So you'll have a realistic number of page views. Well, somebody might take issue to that, so you don't want to get your page views down because you still use it as a KPI, right? Or something silly. So I have to plug this guy, Joshua Koren, this amazing Israeli guy. He wrote an article about how to not block the page views, but how to count real time on page based on visible pages only. So time on page is only calculated for visits that are actually on a page that is visible, not for the ones you open in browser tabs. It's a very, very cool, very cool trick here, so I have to plug it. Those are, oh, this is Summer House again, I know. Jaw dropping, right? Jealousy all around. So just a bonus trick, picking up where Aleda left on, you can actually inject meta descriptions with GTM, and the JavaScript literate crawlers in, in Google actually read those and take them into account when they're doing, doing the page indexing. We actually, I think Don had an had a issue with, it, with a similar situation when he was injecting A-B testing stuff and the crawlers actually took the variation. It was injected with JavaScript and the crawlers took the variation because they're so powerful. So now we're thinking about ways how to exclude JavaScript API enforced uh, variations from the Google index. It's gonna be an interesting problem in the future. And the, and this, JSON LD that Alayda showed, you can actually put that in a t GTM tag and fire it on your site. This is social profiles for my knowledge graph, if I'm ever powerful enough to actually have a knowledge graph. You can add site link search boxes, you can add event data and all that kind of stuff through GTM, and the Google crawlers will be able to read it. That's, I think that's so cool. That's one of the, I mean, you should always do it server side. You should always do it as part of the page template, but if you can't, or if you want to prototype it, proof of concept it, just use GTM, it lets you do it. So finally, you know, I was talking about how data is difficult. So I have these kind of three laws, or three rules. I'm, st I'm ending up with a boring uh, theory part, which is, you know, a bell curve. Excitement was up here, and now we're going just slowly down, down spiraling. Data is supposed to be difficult. There's a, data does nothing, it beats nothing. So many people say, the data shows, or the data tells, so they hide behind a passive agent, as if the data t tells you anything. An analyst who looks at the data tells us, so he has an, she or he has an emotional bias towards that data. They did, they, that's how you, how you should never trust like statisticians. You should always ask for sources, always ask for data, and always ask for the background information. So data is a passive medium. The rule of data subjectivity means a single data set can be horrible data, it can be bad quality data for some questions, it can be perfectly good for others. The number of page views on your site, it's bad data for analyzing content engagement because it's just a counter. It's good data for analyzing which pages were loaded the most. Uh, LinkedIn endorsements, right, we all love them. They're bad data for actually telling me if somebody's proficient in something. They're good data for telling how popular they are or how many connections they have. Um, Twitter retweets. Bad data for telling me if it's actually a good article, good data for telling me about the virality of that article. So you're using a single data set and the subjective interpretation changes depending on your perspective. And the third one, which is really important in the era of big data, the rule of data scarcity. We have a shitload of data, 
but we will never have all the data because that's a philosophical problem. We have to go all the way back to the Big Bang if you believe in that, or the turtles or whatever, and um, that's when we'll have all the data. And even then we have multiple universes and stuff like, weird stuff like that. So we have to draw a line somewhere. With, with GA, it's easy. It's, it's a JavaScript and cookie-based protocol. We won't have data um, that's stateless. We won't have persistent data. We won't have backend data. With the app world, it's more difficult. My, my Facebook is on right now. It's collecting data all the time. Um, so, so we have to draw a line. And that's where, this is like a behavior, uh, empiricist principle. A fair research is done when you tell the limitations of your data, not the boundaries, not how good it is. You tell the limitations of the data. So I have to say that, you know, according to the data we gathered, based on these limitations, I can draw the following conclusions. So data quality is directly proportional to how well you understand the data collection mechanism. You can't say anything about bounce rate as a KPI until you understand how it was collected. I don't trust anybody who talks about session-based conversion rate if I know that they don't understand what a session is. So data quality becomes this thing of knowledge, not an attribute of the data itself, and then we can have the stock photo party. Then we've deserved it, because data quality isn't acquired. You don't receive data quality. You work for it. You earn data quality. Put yourself into the thing and it starts working. Thank you. Uh, so what do you do against uh, spam traffic like semalt.com and how do you um, create filters to prevent future spam domains? Yeah, so uh, yeah, let's, let's not go there too much, uh, but uh, there's two kind of types of spam. Spam that hits your site and the spam that's sent with the measurement protocol. And the second one is nasty because you can't block it with, with um, like GTM or anything because it never lands on your site. It's sent with the measurement protocol as HTTP requests. So for, for measurement protocol spam, the host name filter is the best one. So include only hits from host names that you know are valid. Your own host name, your subdomains and stuff like that. Because the spam, measurement protocol spam rarely has a valid host name. The way it works is they just ruffle through a random set of UA codes and hope that some of them stick. And then from the on-site spam, unfortunately, there are no kind of magic bullets there. You just have to keep on building a set of referral exclusions. And do not use the referral exclusion feature of GA, by the way. That doesn't remove spam. It just turns it to direct, direct traffic, so you'll never know where that came from. So create filters. I, I wrote a little open source tool, um, the spam filter insertion tool, or shit, no, sorry, fit. Um, for, for short, it lets you add the filters automatically to your site. I think that there's a link in that in my tools section. But yeah, it's, it's a diff Google is working actively on it, and I know this, and I know that many people are disappointed about their lack of interaction, but there were, we were just at the summit, and they are working really actively on finding solutions. All right, question about identifying users, uh, user ID, session ID, tracking, and so on. So, A, like, is, is there anything in Google Analytics terms of service that says you can't link data to, uh, you know, real people? No. No. The only thing the terms of service is explicit about is looking at GA data, you're not allowed to identify a person. No social security numbers, no... People, this is a good tip. Go to your all pages report in your site content and search for the at sign. It's so easy to accidentally pass the user's email address in the URL query parameters to your site, to your GA data. That's PII. If Google identifies them and they're feeling bitchy, they will kill your data from the time they first find the ad design to the time it's removed. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good auditing practice. So you're allowed to do whatever you want in your backend. You're allowed to pull the data out. You can add the user ID, which is a hash string, pull it out, combine it with your CRM. That's perfect. I mean, Justin Cotroni, the chief evangelist, he has an article about it. It should be okay if he can do it. So you can do whatever you want in the back end, but in GA, do not collect any data that can personally identify directly. I mean, a good data scientist needs three data points to identify personally somebody. But you can't see it as a direct dimension, like Simo Ahava from Helsinki, Leppalinnon Polko 12 Espo. That would be pretty condemning. I just gave you my home address. Feel free to come over any time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> How has your experience been with Snowplow? Oh, yeah. So first of all, those guys are amazing. Uh, there's a conference in, in London called Measure Camp, which is an unconference. They're always there, willing to help you out. So Snowplow is precisely the right direction we need to take in fighting the sessionization problem. The way it works is it collects a shitload of data, 
and you start building the schema from bottom up. So you're in charge of how the sessions are built. You're in charge of how the event dictionaries work. Um, I have to say I've never used it with a client. The problem with these tools is that uh, they require a very, very large implementation project, which is in this era where people have the attention span of a corkscrew, you know, we, we want results immediately. So it, it takes a lot of time. But data is difficult. Snowplow is fighting difficult data by making it even more difficult. So I respect the guys. Um, it's more BI, it's more data building, but it's a very, very cool solution to the sessionization. We'll take a look at, at them, definitely. Thank you, Simon. Cheers.